So actually, I start this talk about fictional characters by looking at, uh, at fictional names and how we use fictional names because that sheds some light on, on fictional characters themselves. And I think that there are three types of three ways of using fictional names. Names like Sherlock Holmes, by fictional name, I mean the name of a fictional character. So the character is fictional, but the name also is fictional. It's not that there is a real name referring to a real person. It's rather a pretend name referring to a pretend person. But anyway, I think there are three types of uses. And one of them is particularly problematic. And I want to try to understand how that works. And that's very complex. So what I'm going to say is very tentative. So the three types of uses I call fictional meta-fictional and, and par-fictional. The fictional uses, like this example here, which is a made-up example, suppose that you read a Sherlock Holmes story and you find a sentence, Sherlock Holmes shoot his head and lit his pipe. So that's the sort of use I have in mind. In the fiction itself, you find sentences that use, actually, that contain the name of a fictional character. How should we understand that? The use of proper names in fiction for talking about persons who don't exist, but well, we have to, uh, there is a view that according to which fiction is a sort of pretense, an elaborate pretense, a game of made-believe, and that's the sort of view that I endorse. So let's say that the storyteller pretends to be telling known facts about some actual individual. So that's pretense. And there is a pretend reference. So the storyteller pretends to refer to a particular individual by means of the name, so pretends that the individual exists, that the name exists, and is the name of that individual. So it's all pretense. And that's not too difficult to understand. The, the, the same sort of mechanisms that are at work in ordinary cases of reference to individuals we are acquainted with, uh, the same mechanisms are invoked in, uh, in this case, except that it's all pretense. We pretend that we are acquainted with an individual and we can refer to him using his name. Not very difficult to understand. I won't elaborate on this. The metafictional uses are very, very, very different. So those are the uses like this one here. Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character created by Conan Doyle. Uh, so here we are talking about, well, there are many aspects of these uses that are important. First, in contrast to the first type of use, in the first type of use, when you say Sherlock Holmes shoot his head and lit his pipe, you're the storyteller. Uh, you pretend to say something true about an individual whom you pretend you're referring to, but the individual doesn't exist, you're not really referring to him, and you're not really saying anything true or false because it's just made up, it's, it's pretense. But here we have this, the very strong intuition that metafictional uses on the sentence like this one is uh, are actually, I mean, th this sentence is actually true. We're saying something true about the fiction when we say that. It's absolutely true that Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character invented by Conan Doyle. And we can also say things like it was invented, in its first appearance was in 1887 or something like this. We can say all sorts of things about the fiction that are true things. And to say those true things about the fiction, we can use the, 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 the fictional names. We can talk about the fictional character which was invented by Sherlock Holmes using the name, uh, invented by Conan Doyle, sorry, using the name uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes. So it seems that because what we say when we say Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character created by Conan Doyle, because what we say is true, it seems that we must succeed in referring to something when we use the name Sherlock Holmes. Because if we didn't manage to actually refer to something, how could the statement be true? But what we are referring to here, if we are really referring to it, that must be something that exists. It's, it can be something that doesn't exist, like uh, as in the fictional use of, of the name Sherlock Holmes when we say he shook his head and lit his pipe. In this case, this is pretense. We are not really referring. But now we are saying something that's true or false, and we are, it seems, referring to something. So what are we referring to? Well, I believe that we should take the statement at face value. What we are referring to here when we say Sherlock Holmes we are referring to something that was created by Conan Doyle, a fictional character that was created by Conan Doyle. That's what we are talking about when we say that it was actually created by Conan Doyle. Now, what is a fictional character in that sense? Something that can be created by an author? Well, it's a, I won't go into the metaphysics of those things, but clearly it's a sort of a cultural object. An artifact, something that is made by, by man, that's created by someone, uh, except that it's abstract. 
so there are, there are people who theorize about the, the nature of those objects, those cultural objects that come into existence as a result of human activities of storytelling. Uh, so, so, so I will use Thomason's uh, phrase, abstract artifact. So it's something abstract, uh, like an idea in a way, but, uh, but, but it's something that's made, that comes, that comes into being at a certain point in time, that's made by man and so on. So that's an abstract artifact. Or we may think of it as a cultural object, cultural entity. Uh, so it's a bit like the Fifth Symphony or things like that, also cultural entities that come into existence at, at a certain point. So again, I'm not, this is not a talk in metaphysics, so I'm not specifically concerned with the status of those objects, but there is this broad category of cases which we were dealing with something that's sort of abstract, but that's still that's an artifact, that's a cultural, art, cultural entity, and so on. Well, there are some people who have written about this. And I take it that even though we don't know exactly what the, those entities are, it's worth for metaphysicians, but still we, we have a certain idea that it's something very different from a flesh and blood individual. So when we talk about Sherlock Holmes, the thing that was invented in, in a certain year by Conan Doyle, we're not talking about a flesh and blood individual because the flesh and blood, well, you were talking about a, a cultural object, something like that. So that's the second case, the metafictional views. And now the difficult case, I said that there are three types of views and the one that's rather tricky and the one that's rather tricky is the third one. That's the parafictional views. So that the illustration are all those cases which start with something like in the book, in the film, in the fiction, blah, blah. And the blah, blah describes what's going on in the film, in the book, or in the fiction. So for example, you can have a sentence like in the story, or you can say or not say in the story that may be implicit. Holmes is a private detective investigating cases for various clients, including Scotland Yard. So that's a sort of description of what's going on in the story. And in describing what's going on in the story, you use the name Sherlock Holmes, and you say something about his doings. Now, what's interesting is that here, it's quite similar in a way to the, to the fictional uses, because, because the predicates, what we're saying of the, the character here, like being a private detective, investigating cases, those predicates are applied to the flesh and blood individual. That's the flesh and blood individual who can be a detective, uh, smoke a pipe, uh, play the violin, or investigate cases. And that's the sort of thing that we predicate of Sherlock Holmes when we describe what's going on in the story. So it seems that here we're referring to the flesh and blood individual, that is the individual who does not exist, the imaginary individual. So that it's, it seems that it's like the fictional uses they're the same sort of predicates, very different from what we have in the metafictional uses in which the, pre the, pre the predicates there are things like created in a certain year, invented by a certain author, uh, very popular in the, at a certain time and things like that. So those things apply to cultural objects, but the sort of thing that we say about Sherlock Holmes in the parafictional uses are the same sort of thing we say of Sherlock Holmes in the fictional uses. So it seems that it's similar sort of case, very comparable to the fictional uses. But there is a very big difference with the fictional uses. The parafictional uses occur in statements that are true or false. Uh, at least we have the strong intuition that they are true or false. In contrast to the fictional uses, the fictional uses are, in, are involved in fictional statements that we know are pretense. We're not, we're not serious. So it's just a matter of engaging in some game of make-believe. But the, 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 as, as Fredo said, the issue of truth or falsity doesn't arise because it's fiction. But with parafictional uses, the question arises. So you may well ask the question, is this true or false, this statement, Holmes is a private detective investigating cases for various clients, including Scotland Yard. And, and, and anyone who knows the stories will say, yes, that's true. That's what happens in the stories. If you had instead a different parafictional a uh, statement like in the story, Holmes is a baker or something like that, you would say, no, that's false. That's not what he is. He's a detective. You're confusing <laughs> different stories. So, so this is true or false. And this is a big difference between the fictional uses and the parafictional uses. And this puts the parafictional uses on the, on, on the par with the, the metafictional uses. But, because when you use the name metafictionally as saying something like Sherlock Holmes was invented in such and such a year, uh, when you say that, you, you say something that's true or false too. Uh, 
So we have uh, three categories of cases, and the parafictional uses, they have something like, they are a bit like the fictional uses, and they are a bit like the metafictional uses. They share properties with both of them, which makes them very difficult to understand, which is why I said that they are rather tricky. And my immediate object here, my, my goal, my aim, is to actually understand those parafictional uses, and I think that because they share properties, uh, both with the fictional uses and with the metafictional uses, there are two views, two, two possible theories about them that try to reduce them to either of the other category. So the two views or the two approaches or the two analyses are one I call the metafictional analysis, which treats parafictional uses as just another variety of metafictional use. So the idea is that there are these two uses, fictional, rest on pretense, metafictional, we now we don't, we, we talk about something that exists, but that's abstract. There are these two categories, and parafictional uses, according to one view, are like the fictional uses. There are a variety of fictional use. According to the other view, there are a variety of metafictional use. And both views uh, raise difficulties that I'm going to briefly mention. So the fictional analysis, very simple. It says that in a parafictional statement, like the statement I've used as an example in Conan Doyle's stories, Sherlock Holmes is a private detective. In such statement, the fictional name is used in the same way it is used in fictional statements. That is, there is pretend reference to the flesh and blood individual who doesn't exist, rather than actual reference to the abstract object. We're not talking about the abstract object, we're talking about the flesh and blood individual. He doesn't exist, therefore it's not really pretend reference, it's rather pretend reference. So as Evan says, uh, this sort of talk is a continuation of the pretense that happens in the fictional case, in the case in which we, the storyteller uh, pretends to refer to someone, and pretends to tell true facts about him or her. Or as McDowell says, we play along with the practitioners of the fiction when we describe the fiction. So that's one view. And the obvious objection to this view, very serious objection, is that if really that was pretense rather than genuine reference, then the statement should be neither true nor false. It should be exactly like a fictional statement. Fictional statement, as I said, it's pretense, it's not serious. Therefore, the question of truth or falsity does not really arise. <coughs> but here, the, fictional, the, the, the parafictional statements, they are true or false. We, we correctly describe the story by means of a statement like in the story of Holmes is a detective. And that, as I said, that implies by certain familiar principles that we must actually refer to something, genuinely refer to something when we say Sherlock Holmes in this context. So that's the problem. How can the statement be true or false if it rests on pretense? Now, there is a response to this objection. I'm not going to dwell on it very much. It's interesting in its own right, but I've uh, got much to say, so I can't spend too much time on that. But there is this idea that you can exploit pretense for serious purposes. That is, you may do something that's pretense as a in a sort of instrumental manner in order to com convey something that is actually true or false. Or, this is a quote from Mark Crimmins, statements that rely on make-believe can be used to express genuine claims and can be candidates for genuine truth and falsehood. One of his examples is something like uh, Mary is as clever as Sherlock Holmes and as modest as, 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 as Watson, something like this, in, which is sort of a try to say something about Mary, the real person, and sort of convey something about her, something that is possibly true or false, but, but we do that. Well, anyway, it's, this is a complex example, so for, for, forget about it. So the idea here that we are going to invoke the, a, a classical distinction in the philosophy of language between what we say literally and what we communicate. And there are plenty of cases in which we, what we say literally is, for example, false, but still we manage to communicate something that may be true. Like, for example, if I say I'm starving, meaning that I'm hungry. It's not true, I'm not starving, but by saying that I'm starving, this is sort of exaggeration, I communicate that I'm hungry, and that's true. So there are many, many cases like this. And in particular, there is this phenomenon of conversational implicature in which you can imply something by saying something else. 
so what you imply is what you actually communicate. What you say may, as I said, be false. It's not really the problem. The problem is you want to communicate something. What you communicate may be true even if what you say uh, is, is actually false. And there is another option, which is that what you say is neither true nor false. But by saying something that literally is neither true nor false, you may still convey something true. And in particular, so this is the sort of case we have. He, there is this possibility. It's not exactly the sort of case that Bryce had in mind when he talked about conversational implicatures, but it's possible to imply something by pretending to say something else. So that would be the case at stage. By saying something like Sherlock Holmes is a detective, he has such and such properties, uh, we don't really express any true proposition. We don't even express a proposition because we are pretend to re we are not really referring to anything by Sherlock Holmes. It's only pretense. But by engaging in this sort of pretense, we manage to convey something about the feature, about the pretense itself. And the mechanism would be similar to the mechanism of, of, of pragmatic implication. That is saying something may imply, uh, imply other things. So and maybe we can talk about that in the q and I'm not going to talk about the mechanism here that we can invoke to explain how, by saying something that's literally neither true nor false because it involves some kind of pretense, which nevertheless managed to say something true about the fiction. Uh, this is something that has been studied, and the sort of view that I like is the view defended by Ken Walton that uh, uses a sort of pragmatic mechanism. But let's suppose that there is a story to be told in that area appealing to the semantics pragmatics distinction. And, and let's move to the other analysis, the other way of looking at the uh, the other way of construing the parafictional uses. So the first analysis says parafictional uses, they're just like fictional uses. We pretend to refer, but the difference is that by so doing, we convey something true about the fiction itself. Second analysis, the metafictional analysis. Now, the metafictional analysis says that in a parafictional statement, like Sherlock Holmes is a detective, he does this and that, in such a statement, the fictional term Sherlock Holmes refers to the abstract entity, the cultural object, the artifact, the thing that was created by an author in such and such a year, exactly as it does in metafictional statements like Sherlock Holmes was created by Conan Doyle. So that's the view. And that's, it's very counterintuitive. Because when we say Sherlock Holmes is a detective, his friend with Watson, blah, 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 it seems that we are not talking about the cultural object. It seems that we are talking about the flesh and blood individual, the imaginary individual. And the objection to that view, based on this intuition, is that an abstract artifact, the sort of thing that can be created by man, by an author, by a writer, an abstract artifact cannot investigate cases, play the violin, wear a hat, a funny hat, those are all the sort of properties that we ascribe to Holmes in, in parafictional thought when we describe what's going on in the story are properties, as I said earlier, of a flesh and blood individual. They are not properties of cultural objects. So that's the objection. And here, again, there is a response to the objection, just as the, the objection to the fictional approach can be overcome by appealing to the semantics, pragmatics, distinction, Similarly, we can respond to this objection that the sort of property we apply, we ascribe to Holmes in parafictional talk, can't be the sort of property that fits an abstract artifact, and therefore that shows that what we are referring to cannot be the abstract artifact in such cases. And the response is to say that there are two modes of predication. When we say that something has a certain property, this is sort of ambiguous, at least in certain cases, like the cases at hand. Normally, when we ascribe a property to an object, we present the property in question as being a property which the object exemplifies, that the object has. But in the case of the, the fictional character, in the case of a cultural object, certainly a cultural object, like Sherlock Holmes construed as a human invention. A cultural object exemplifies certain properties, like the property of having been created in such and such a year, having a certain person as, 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 as creator, or things like that. All those properties of, of, of the abstract artifact are properties that the abstract artifact exemplifies. But in addition to the property that the abstract artifact exemplifies, 
There are also properties which the abstract artifact encodes. For what is this abstract artifact? What is this cultural object Sherlock Holmes? It's a representation, basically. It's a representation that public, that's shared by anyone who's read the book or seen the films. It's a public representation, and the representation has a content. That is, it represents something. It encodes certain property of that which it represents. So when we say that Sherlock Holmes is a detective, on this view, we are referring to the cultural object, the abstract artifact. But the properties that we are ascribing are not, pro are not properties that the which the abstract artifact exemplifies, but properties which the abstract artifact encodes. So the same statement, Sherlock Holmes is F, can mean, if we are referring to the, to the abstract artifact, can mean either that the abstract artifact exemplifies the property F, like when we say Sherlock Holmes was created in 1887, but if we say Sherlock Holmes is a detective, here we are still talking about the same cultural object, but we are saying which property it encodes, and it encodes the property being a detective, being very clever, wearing a special hat, smoking the pipe, playing the violin, all the properties that are ascribed to the flesh and blood individual in the fiction, in pretense, are properties which the cultural object which emerges out of this practice of pretense, all these properties that are ascribed to to the flesh and blood individual in the fiction are properties that are encoded by the cultural object, that are shared by anybody who, who has access to that cultural object, and those properties encoded are the properties that are ascribed to the, to the cultural object in the parafictional statement. So parafictional statements are just a variety of, 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 of metafictional statements in which the properties uh, ascribed are properties exemplified by the flesh and blood individual but only encoded by the cultural object. I hope that's clear despite the intrinsic complexity. So there are these two views. They both raise an objection, and they both, in both cases, the objection can be overcome by appealing to a further distinction, in a semantic pragmatic distinction in one case, and the other case, the distinction between encoded and exemplifying. And now I want to turn to an argument, an alleged potential argument for the metafictional approach. And that's, I told that, the argument from anaphora. So look at this piece of discourse, two sentences here. Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character created by Conan Doyle. He is a private detective who investigates cases for a variety of clients, including Scotland Yard. So what I did, in, I put together a metafictional sentence, that the one that I talked about earlier, Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character created by Conan Doyle, and I present it as obvious that here we're talking about the cultural object, only a cultural object can be created by, by an author. And then we have the second sentence, is a parafictional sentence in which we're ascribing to Holmes properties like being a detective and investigative cases. So I put them together, and what's interesting is that there is a link between the two sentences in this discourse. The link is represented by this subscript here, which shows that the pronoun he in the second sentence is anaphoric on the name in the first sentence. And the argument from anaphora basically says that the anaphoric link shows that the pronoun in the parafictional statement well, I should go back to So the, the anaphoric link shows that the pronoun he in he is a private detective refers to the same thing as the name Sherlock Holmes in the first statement. Now we we admitted that in the first statement, the metafictional statement, Sherlock Holmes was created by Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes here refers to this abstract object, this abstract artifact, this sort of a concept that was created by Conan Doyle. So now if we add that because there is an anaphoric link, the pronoun refers to the same thing. The conclusion is that in the partitional statement, he, Sherlock Holmes, is a private detective who investigates cases, we are still talking about the cultural object, the, the, the sort of a conceptual inv invention. And that's exactly the parafictional view. So that's an argument for the parafictional analysis. Uh, sorry, the metafictional analysis. Sorry, I keep confusing things. I hope you correct. So that's the argument. What I'm doing here.
going in the wrong direction. Now there is a problem with this argument, a potential problem. And the problem is that it rests, the argument rests on the principle that if there is an aphora, if there is an anaphoric link between, say, a pronoun and an antecedent name, then the two things have got to refer to the same object. And that's something that's generally taken for granted. Anaphora entails co-reference, perhaps, if, if the thing's really well. But, but, but there are counterexamples. So a counterexample would be something like this. I mean, you can find plenty of that in natural language. Lunch was delicious, but it took forever. Here there is the anaphora, the pronoun it. Uh, is an aphoric on lunch in the first sentence. But when you say lunch was delicious, you're talking about the food that you had for lunch. And when you say it took forever, you're not talking about the food anymore. You're talking about the social event. So it seems that here there is an aphora, but we're not really talking about the same thing. So if that's true, why not say that the same thing happens in the other case? So we cannot move from there being an aphoric link to the fact that this perfectional statement and the metafictional statement are really about the same thing. Now, many people respond that actually we are talking about the same thing in the lunch case. And because indeed there are two entities, there is the food and there is the social event. And when we talk about lunch, we're talking about these two things, these two aspects. But these two aspects are two aspects of the same entity, which is a sort of hybrid entity involving both something like food and the social event. Uh, lunch is a something complex that involves different facets. And we have to think of the complex entity along those lines as a hybrid involving different, possibly different entities, but which are linked as different aspects, different facets of the same more complex reality. And, uh, and the people who, who defend this sort of view, they introduce the, the expression dot object for it, uh, the, that sort of complex entities that has very different facets belonging to different ontological categories, possibly. So, for example, a book is said to be such a dot object because a book, when you're talking about a book, a book is both a physical object, something that can be heavy, that you can carry in your suitcase. At the same time, it's a certain content, informational content. And these are really two different ways of individuating something by informational content or to a physical object. And the book has both these aspects. So there are different ways of individuating books that are sort of mixed in this sort of hybrid that we call a book. And the idea is that the, the, perhaps the same is true about fictional characters. Indeed, here I've got a quotation from a, a philosopher who specializes in fiction, and, and that's it. And he, he does remark that, indeed, when we talk about fictional characters, there are these two aspects. We talk about fictional characters simultaneously as if they were real people who did what they are portrayed as doing in the story, and as fictional things that are created by authors, play roles in plots, and reflect the cultural and social prejudices of the author of the society which gives drive to them. So that suggests that perhaps we should think of fictional characters a bit like books as having different aspects, different facets, as being dot objects. And if we accept that the fictional character is a dot object with this different size, then we can say that in the discourse we had with these two sentences and the anaphoric link, well, we're talking about the same thing throughout. That's why anaphora is possible. But the thing we are talking about throughout is this two-sided entity that has these two aspects. It's a dot object. So it's like the lunch example. So on this view, the type of fictional character is a complex type involving two distinct facets, which we may call the internal facet. That is, the internal facet is the flesh and blood individual who we pretend to refer to when we're on offer. So that would be the internal facet, that which is represented by the cultural object. And the external facet is the cultural object itself, the thing that comes into being as a result of the, this public activity of pretense. And when we have uh, well. So does this justify or vindicate the metafictional analysis? Well, to some extent, but only to some extent. The argument establishes that we're talking in this discourse with these two sentences, we are talking about the same fictional character throughout this discourse. That's why anaphora is possible. We are always talking about this cultural object, but the second sentence, the perfectional sentence, talks about the internal facet. 
of the fictional object, namely the, the flesh and blood individual who doesn't really exist. And, and that internal facet corresponds to what the cultural object encodes. But I think that the fictional analysis is not disproved, far, far from it, actually, that's the view that I, that I think is, is, is better in this case. Uh, even though I think that we can sort of accept the intuitions behind both theories. I think the, the fictional analysis is not disproved. Oops, sorry. It's not disproved because we have this notion that there are two distant facets. There is the internal facet and the external facet. And whenever we are talking about a, a dot object, like a hybrid, we have this, the predicate. Which predicate we use actually selects which facet we're talking about. We are, each time we need to choose which facet you're talk, we're talking about. Even if there are these dot objects that are hybrid, hybrid when we speak or think, something does the selection of the relevant facet. So, and that's exactly what the fictional analysis says. The fictional analysis says that the first sentence is metafictional because we are actually talking about the external facet, the cultural object. While the second sentence, the parafictional sentence, is a sentence in which we are talking about the internal facet. That is, we are talking about the flesh and blood individual here when we say that he is a detective. That's for sure the internal facet of the cultural object. That's what is represented. But that's what we are talking about in the second sentence. And, and I said that the pronoun he refers to the flesh and blood individual. I put a P at refers because what sort of reference is that? Well, that's pretend reference because that flesh and blood individual doesn't exist. And it's an important insight of the fictional approach. And I think that's something that should be maintained that in order to talk about the internal facet of the fictional character, that is, in order to talk about the flesh and blood individual who's represented in the stories, the speaker who describes what's going on in, in, in the stories, the speaker has to engage in the pretense that's constitutive of the fiction. If you ask me to tell you what's going on in the film or in the book, the only thing I can do is start pretending to refer to Holmes, to Watson, and describing their relationships. We've got to enter into the pretense in order to describe from the inside what's going on in the book. There is no other way of describing the content of the book than engaging in the pretense. So think of the point of view of the hearer. That's even more obvious when you take the point of view of the hearer, the, the audience. The only way for the audience to access the internal content of a fiction is to actually imagine what the fiction prescribes its practitioners to imagine. So f fiction itself, the practice of fiction is a matter of imagination. Anyone who consumes the fiction, who sort of reads the book or watches the film, has got to imagine something and is led to imagine by the book or by the film. There is a sort of a prescription to imagine that corresponds basically to, to the content of the film or the content of the book. And the only way to know what's going on in a fiction is to imagine the relevant thing, to follow the instruction and imagine that. And when you do parafictional speech, you basically give instructions to your audience to imagine along certain lines. You say, Sherlock Holmes is a detective, so the guys to imagine a detective, and so on and so forth. So even though we are actually, the, the whole thing is a characterization of a cultural object for sure, but still, in order to provide the relevant characterization of the internal content, we have to go through pretense. And that's what the fictional approach says. OK, so I don't I have very little time left. And I would like to try very briefly to reframe the whole issue in more cognitive terms, because this idea of dot objects, which are used, this idea of a hybrid with different criteria of individuation that are, is used in, in the literature, especially in the computational linguistics literature, to talk about those phenomena of so-called co-predication, like the lunch example, this is a notion that, from a metaphysical standpoint, is very strange and bizarre. What sort of object is that? No one knows. Uh, so it's probably better not to go, uh, not, <laughs> not to assume such a notion. So, but I think the insight, this idea that there is this two-sidedness, is very important. But it can be reframed in more cognitive terms. So let's try to do that. Let's say that there are dot concepts rather than dot objects. That is, this two-sidedness of the dot objects 
I think not clear that dot object exists, but at least we find this two-sidedness at the level of the concepts. So concepts I take to be mental files, basically. So when we are acquainted with objects or entities and so on, and that we gain knowledge about them, we store the knowledge in sort of dossiers or files uh, that are our concepts, the way we, which we use to think about those objects. And the concepts in question, the files in question, they are based on certain the relations we have to those objects, which enables us to gain information from them. And, but anyway, let me not go into this theory of files. Uh, what matters is that I have this notion of concept that corresponds to a file or a dossier of information. And typically, we open a dossier of information when we encounter an object, where we're in contact with an object, when there is some informational connection to an object. And in the fictional case, we are not really in contact with Sherlock Holmes, but we pretend to be. And for example, the storyteller pretends to be somehow acquainted with the guy and to be telling true facts about, to be reporting uh, facts about that person. So, 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 so a book like uh, the Sherlock Holmes story pretends to be a, t a piece of testimony about some real individual. So this is pretense, but so there is this mental file corresponding to this testimonial relation to the individual. It's, it's, it's a, a pretend file. It's not a genuine file based on a genuine connection to the object, but we pretend that there is an object and we open the file as, if we as we would do if there were a real individual. So this, again, is not very complicated, this stuff about pretense that can be applied to files as well as to reference in general. So what about the case of the metafictional statements? Well, here I think that Met here also we have a sort of mental file, but it's a mental file not about the, it's a mental file about the abstract object. So we know that uh, there are, uh, so, so for example, I can have a file about the Fifth Symphony, I can have a, have a file about the iPhone as a type of object, we can have files about abstract objects, that's something that we talked about earlier in the week. Uh, so we can also have mental files about such objects, uh, and there is the issue, how do we what, is, what sort of connection do we have to those objects, given that they are abstract? And that's an interesting issue, but I have no time for it now. But I suppose that in addition to our, our pretend file or fictional file about the, the imaginary individual, a file which we open when we read the book because we engage in pretense, we do as if there was this real individual and we were being told true facts about them. Uh, in addition to those fictional files, there is the serious meta-fictional file, which we, because we know that there is this fictional character Holmes, and we know things about it, we know who the author is, we know when it was created, so we also open a metafictional file about that abstract object. Now this is a view that was actually put forward by Enrico Teron in his uh, so-called two fineness hypothesis. He says that whenever there is a fictional character, there are two files. One is the fiction file, he calls it, in which we have the information about, about the, the flesh and blood individual, the non-existent individuals, so there we store the information that he's a detective, he wears a certain sort of hat, he smokes the pipe, he plays the violin, he solves cases, he's friend with Watson, and all the things we know about this pretend individual is there in the fiction file. But he says that in addition to the fiction file, we have another file, which is the source file. It's a file in which we store the information about the cultural object itself, like created by Conan Doyle, uh, very famous at a certain time, and so on. All this information about the cultural object goes into a different file, which he calls the source file. Now, I think this is quite right. We should have two files, the fictional file, that's based on pretense, and the metafictional file, that's a file about the cultural object that emerges, is brought about by the activity of pretense, through the activity of pretense. But there is a, a something I want to say is that it's not in the metafictional file, the file about the fictional character, the file about the cultural object. We should not simply have the external information about when it was created, who the author was, and so on. Because if that's the only thing you know about Sherlock Holmes, that he was created by Conan Doyle on such and such a year, you don't know anything. In order to know something about Sherlock Holmes, you need to know who's, who that fictional, that cultural object represents, what are the sort of uh, nuclear properties, uh, as, as philosophers say, uh, of, of the individual. That is, the, the properties exemplified by the imaginary individuals. That's an important aspect of the cultural object, what it encodes. So in the metafictional file about the cultural object, we should have two types of information. We should have this sort of external information or an extra nuclear information, who created that, in the, well, that, 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 that character, when, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
but also the internal or nuclear information about the character as, as a flesh and blood individual represented in the fiction. Namely, is a detective, uh, plays the violin. So all that could be in the metafictional fight. And that captures this two-sidedness of the dot object. But at this point, I want to introduce a, a remark. All this information, this internal information about the Holmes as wearing a certain hat, playing the violin, uh, taking cocaine, being friends with Watson, all the information, the internal or nuclear information about Holmes, is already there in the fictional file. Because when we imagine Holmes, we have this fictional file which we deploy when we pretend. And, and that's, the file contains all this information. So this information doesn't have to be copied into the metafictional file. It doesn't have to be replicated there. It needs to be there somehow. But it's already available in the fictional file. So what happens, what I suggest, is that we have the fictional file. That's what we deploy when we read the book, when we watch the film. Uh, and we have the metafictional file about the cultural object. That file contains two types of information, as I said. It contains the external information about who created the, the character and the author and all that. But all the rest, the internal information, is, need not be uh, copied. It's enough if the metafictional file contains a pointer to the fictional file. So there's something in the metafictional file that leads you back to the fictional file. And that's an, an essential aspect of the metafictional file, that it contains this pointer. The pointer refers you to the, all the internal nuclear information about the character, which you will find in the, in, the, in, the, in the fictional file. Now, what's interesting in this structure is that it's a structure of dependence. There is one file that contains a pointer to the other. So the metafictional file depends upon the fictional file for a good deal of its content, I mean, all the internal or nuclear content. So there is this asymmetric dependence. And because of that dependence, we cannot or can hardly think of the fictional character Sherlock Holmes without thinking of the flesh and blood individual Sherlock Holmes. So when you think of, the, of this cultural object Sherlock Holmes, you are automatically led to imagine the guy with the, the, the pipe and the hat. And, you, know. you can do I mean, that that's sort of automatic because there is this sort of internal link between the, the two files. And that's what explains the, this smooth transition that we find in the anaphoric case between we start with talking about the metafictionally uh, about the cultural object construed from the external point of view. And then suddenly we shift to this internal characterization and we're now in parafictional talk. This is possible because of this two-sided structure of the parafictional file and this isometric dependence. Now, the last thing I want to say is that this is really asymmetric dependence. There is this metafictional file that refers you back to the fictional file that depends on the fictional file because in order to access internal information about the fictional character, you need to go through the fiction, through the pretense. There is no other way. But in the other direction, it's certainly possible to think about the flesh and blood individual, the imaginary individual, Sherlock Holmes, to imagine states of affairs involving him without referring to or thinking about the abstract artifact, the cultural object. In other words, you can deploy the fictional file without deploying the metafictional file. So that's what we do when we are immersed in the fiction. While we're immersed in the fiction, we are imagining the individual Holmes, Watson, and seeing in mind's eye, uh, seeing the, the events and so on. We're not thinking about the cultural objects uh, invented by an author. No, we are, we're really imagining the scene with the imaginary individual, the flesh and blood individual. That's all we're doing. So in this case, we're deploying the fictional file. We're not deploying the metafictional file. We're not in the business of thinking or talking about fictional characters. And according to Evans, and I won't have time to say more about this, but that's also according to him what we do in parafictional speech. So in parafictional speech, that's, he says something very simple. I'm going to read from him. He says, an ontology of abstract objects, the kind of ontology we explicitly invoke when we say such things as there are only three characters in the whole of English literature who kill their mothers, or the character of Falstaff has a long history in English drama, uh, that sort of ontology is excessively sophisticated for the needs of professional discourse. Someone can engage in a conversation about what went on in the novel perfectly competently without in any way needing to know how one might count characters where the two authors can use the same character and the like. 
So the idea is that the, so we have the fictional case and the parafictional case, they are very similar. The audience of a fictional utterance imagines a fictional state of affairs, such as Sherlock Holmes shaking his head and lighting his pipe. That's just a matter of imagination. And likewise, the audience of a parafictional statement, like Holmes is a detective that investigates cases and so on, the audience of such a statement also imagines a fictional state of affairs, while at the same time, and that's the trick with the fictional, parafictional case, at the same time as you imagine a state of affairs, you tag that state of affairs as something that holds in the fiction, in the world of the fiction, something like that. So there is this additional bit, but, but, but basically what you do is just reimagine the state of affairs, and the state of affairs involves this imaginary individual shallow Holmes, uh, the flesh and blood individual who doesn't exist. So this is my last slide. So basically the view I've presented can be summarized uh, uh, as, as on this slide, uh, we've got these two files. We've got the metafictional file and the fictional file. When we use a fictional name metafictionally, as in Sherlock Holmes was created in such and such a year, you, the audience has to deploy a metafictional file about the, the cultural object. That's what you're talking about. But this metafictional file about the cultural object bears this sort of internal relation to the fictional file. There is this link to the fictional file, this pointer to the fictional file, which makes it difficult to think about the cultural object without also thinking about the flesh and blood individual who doesn't exist. That is, without uh, undergoing, uh, playing the, the game of make-believe, as it were. There is this internal connection which makes this smooth transition that we saw in the anaphora example uh, possible. And the important thing is that both the fictional uses and the parafictional uses, they involve the deployment of the fictional file. They do not involve, or not necessarily involve, the deployment of the metafictional file because there is this asymmetric dependence between the cases. So this sort of indicates the fictional approach, which, as you remember, says that parafictional uses are a continuation of the pretense uh, that takes place in the fictional uses. And I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you.